Appreciate it. This is an exciting day. And you have to bear with me because I've never done this before. First and foremost, what I want to do is I want to take an opportunity on behalf of Jane and myself to thank you. Last week, uh, on behalf of the church, Jane and Dempsey presented us with a love gift that I want you to know we appreciate it so much. So generous and so loving of you, and uh, I know that that love will transcend to John as he begins his ministry with us. I want to ask you, as our search team comes to present him, if you would please stand. Oak Road Baptist Church. Carl, I'm on. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Come on now. Yeah. <laughs> Oak Road Baptist Church. Currently deliberated back on June 24, 2018, and, and voted on Pastor John. Jonathan Dale Morton. And now today we're at a point now in our church's life where we're having an installation service. And we sub the team here submit John and, uh, and present him to you for his installation. And now today he's going to be called, not our soon to be, but our, our, our senior pastor, John Morton. Praise God for that. Thank you. Y'all will be seated. Hope you look very happy to do this evening. We're <laughs> all in the same boat. I have been authorized as the senior pastor of Oak Road Baptist Church to install Jonathan Dale Morton, our co-worker in the gospel, as the new senior pastor of Oak Road Baptist Church. Uh, and it's been after prayerful deliberation that this church has voted to bring him in. And so we are so excited for his ministry and his service that he will bring to us. I asked Brittany, his wife, to stand behind him because you know this, ladies. Behind every good man is a great woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so I know Brittany's going to be a, uh, an extended... Uh, uh, arm of, of his ministry and just give him comfort and peace during the time that he is with us. John, the first thing I would say to you is the same thing that Jesus said to his disciples over in John chapter 20. He says, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so send I you. And I believe that Jesus is doing exactly that. First Timothy chapter 2 reminds us, first of all, I urge you that supplication, prayers, and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to knowledge and truth in Him. To you, the church at Oak Grove, I give you this charge. You have called Pastor John to be the new pastor of senior pastor of Oak Grove Baptist Church uh, back in June during the post. And so Ephesians chapter 4, Paul reminds us this. He gave some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists, shepherds and teachers. And so John fulfills all of this. What John is not, I want to tell you what he's not. He is not a hireling. He is not somebody to be trampled or somebody to be kicked around. He is a man of God, called by God and confirmed by you. John chapter 10 tells us this, He who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep and sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them away and scatters them. But he who is, uh, he flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. John cares for you. He has cared for you from the very first moment that the interview process started with the search team. First and foremost, he's not a hireling. Second to that, he's not a doormat. He's not somebody to wipe your feet on, somebody to kick around. 
He is somebody that you are to honor and respect. He is not the main course, or if you would, a pot roast for Sunday's dinner following <laughs> church, where, where you want to roast him over some of the things maybe he has said or some of the things that he has done. He is called by God, and he has been recognized by you. He is God's man for this church, for this time. He is your under shepherd. Make it a wonderful and joyful journey for he and for Brittany and for this family. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 tells us this. Obey the leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who must give an account. And let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. He has a high calling from God. Amen. You have recognized that calling, and I want you to strengthen that calling. But you have responsibilities, church. Your responsibilities, let me just give you three in particular. First and foremost, I want you to pray for him. I want you to pray daily for he and for Brittany and for this family, for his leadership and for his discernment and his judgment. Satan is busy at work, yelling around our churches and in our community, trying to break down ministers and pastors and causing them to fall. And we want to, to encourage him with standing up by, by prayer. The attacks on him are going to be relentless. And at times, you may even question his decision making. But he is seeking God's good and perfect will in your life and in the life of this church. Your pastor and his wife live in a glass house. In other words, you see everything that goes on. You know everything that goes on. Don't be throwing rocks at his house. Don't be throwing rocks at him or his family. Uh, love them with the concern and kindness that you've always shown over these last 120 years. I encourage you to pray for Pastor John, for Brittany, and for this family, each and every one. So first and foremost, I want you to be praying daily for them. Second, I want you to be patient with them. Accepting the, the fact that John is walking into a flawed church. I hate to pop your bubble. <laughs> but you are a flawed people. Well, we all are. We are reminded in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. And yet, God has lifted him up and wants him to lead this church. And we want to make sure that we are patient and kind in looking forward to his leadership. The church is made up of sick and defective people who seek the great physician. And I know John looks for the great physician each and every day. I promise you that he will be faithful to preach the word of God and love you as the under shepherd that he is called to be. He will take time, it will take you time to learn all of your names and all of your idiosyncrasies. I know you don't think you have any. <laughs> but each one of you has a little bit of idiosyncrasy and so it's going to take him time to learn all of that. So be patient with him. Be patient with Brittany, his wife, as she seeks to encourage and strengthen him. Put yourself above the issues that we face each and every day and seek to give him encouragement each and every day. So I challenge you as a church at Oak Grove to pray for Pastor John, for Brittany and his family, and to be patient. So you pray and you be patient. Here's the third thing you must do. You must participate. He can't do this job alone. No pastor can do the job alone. It takes each and every one of us. You have been called to this church to fulfill a mission, to fulfill a purpose. God has gifted you in that way. And I want to challenge you to, to find your gift and fulfill that gift. Understand that John can't do this job alone. He needs each and every one of us. He needs his wife beside him to encourage him and needs his family around him to show him that love and support. But he needs his church family to show him that love and support. So I would encourage you to pray for him, be patient to him, and yet to participate in what he does. We're thankful for our search team and for the work that's gone into, the hard work that's gone into, the, the diligent work that's gone into the selection process. And so if you've not had an opportunity, I want you to pat our search team on the back and give them a good attaboy because they have done a wonderful job. And second to that, I want you to affirm and encourage John and his family each and every day. We are to be praying, we are to be patient, and we are to participate with him. You have full responsibilities. 
and he will be faithful in fulfilling his responsibilities, you and I must be faithful in fulfilling our responsibilities as well. Understand this, you are not created to be a spectator. You have been created to be a contestant or participant, if you will, in, in moving this church into the next 120 years. So I challenge you before you, 1 Corinthians, Paul reminds us over 1 Corinthians chapter 9, these words. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but one receives a prize, so you may obtain it? Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive the perishable wealth, but, but we are imperishable. <clears throat> so I challenge you, church, to do this, to pray for him, to be patient, and to participate with him in moving on Road Baptist Church into the next 120 years. If you with me would, would honor that commitment and accept that responsibility, would you say we do? We do. Amen. 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 Steve Bradshaw, who is our area representative for our state convention, the Southern Baptist Conservatives of Virginia, wanted to be with us today, but could not be with us, but he sent a video message. I want you to watch that right now. Church family. I am sorry I can't be with you today on this very special occasion as you welcome your new pastor. But let me just encourage you, I'm excited for this particular day as you celebrate this point in history. Uh, the Lord has blessed you over the years with a great history and heritage, a great foundation founded on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you've had able leadership uh, for many years now, and Pastor Andy Rist, and now as God is calling John Gordon. Pastor, we're really excited about this particular day. Uh, let me just encourage you that uh, you have had a great pastor search team. Uh, pastor, uh, Brother Jerry Green and the team has, has done an outstanding job, dotting the I's, cross the T's. And uh, I am so thrilled with how the Lord has brought forth a match. You know, when you think about pastor and people relationships, when you think about shepherd and sheep, it's almost like a marriage. And so today you're entering into that covenant relationship with your new pastor. And I think you will be blessed as a people. So I want to encourage Pastor John today, as he's starting to freshen the year, to be a good shepherd. Now he's under the leadership of the good shepherd, and if he follows the good shepherd, then he will be a good leader to the people. But I also want to challenge you as a people to be good sheep as you follow the shepherd who follows the good shepherd. So I want to end today by just giving a word of encouragement to Pastor John. Um, it's found in 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. This is about taking heed to your ministry. So let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That's God's challenge to you, Pastor John. It's a challenge to you to be a good shepherd. The congregation is a challenge to you to be a sheep. Congratulations on this milestone. God bless you. As my last official act, I hereby declare that Jonathan Dale Morton has been installed as a new senior pastor of Oak Grove Baptist Church. Let's begin our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You know our beginnings, you know our endings. You know our possibilities and our promises. And we give you thanks for all that has led to this moment and all that is yet to come. We give you thanks for those who mentor us, for men and women whose lives have touched us so deeply and said the words of encouragement that we needed the most. We give thanks too to the Church of Oak Grove Baptist together as we sing and embrace so much change and for all those who have sustained this community of faith 
for so many years passed and not we look as they stand on the threshold of a new generation and looking forward to all that you want to do in the times ahead we give you thanks for pastor john morton and for his family and ask that you would bless him in all the ways they need to be blessed thank you for their faithful traditions that they have had in the past and they will share with us in the future may the words we have spoken and the dreams that we have shared and the faith that we have received this day give pastor john and his family comfort wisdom and encouragement all the days ahead all the ways that often are hard the path is sometimes never clear that the stakes are always high father bless him in all the ways he needs to be blessed god direct him not only this day but in all of his tomorrow father we ask this in jesus name amen right now i'm going to ask you to be seated my dear Pastor John, you come and lead us. Well, you can't uh, you can't throw a rock without hitting a preacher in here this morning. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a few of them in here. I stole that joke from one of my preacher buddies. So when he came in. And uh, I, we are just so excited uh, to be a part of this adventure, to be a part of this journey this morning. And uh, I, I want us to open up God's Word. If you would, uh, I want us to read a passage of Scripture that's going to be very familiar to you. And uh, it, it, if you're thinking, man, this is a weird service. Maybe this is your first time here uh, this morning. Uh, let me just say, it's not always like this. Uh, and if you come back next week, you will get... Uh, pure, unadulterated, unfiltered preaching. Uh, that, that's what you'll get. And, and so we want to invite you to come back uh, next week and every week thereafter. We would love for you to come and be a part of our Oak Grove Baptist Church family. But if you would, I'd love for you uh, to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, we're going to get ready to see Jesus instituting what, when I was growing up, I didn't like the name of it. And it's the Lord's Supper. I couldn't think of anything more deceiving than coming to church and seeing these little trays at the front of the church and then calling that the Lord's Supper. I said, that's not even enough to call the Lord's snack. <laughs> I don't understand this at all. But, but I want us to talk about today what it means to come to the table. So if you would, uh, all stand with me right now. We're just going to read this passage of Scripture together. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse number 26, says this. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Lord God, we are so thankful for the table. We're so thankful for a God who became Emmanuel, God with us who took on the form of a servant, becoming obedient even to the point of death on the cross, to shed his blood for the forgiveness of sin. Lord God, this service isn't about a preacher or even preachers. This service today is not about a church. It's not about an installation. Lord God, this is a worship service. This service is about you. Because, as I will say often, prayerfully from this pulpit, life is not about us. It is all about Jesus. So Lord God, today as we take a look at your word, as we observe the Lord's Supper, communion together, would you bless us? Would you open our eyes and our hearts? God, if there's anyone here today who's never made that decision to follow Jesus, place their faith and their trust in you, may today be the day of salvation. 
We love you. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Love that passage of Scripture. Coming to the table. You know, I, Pastor Andy, he said something that, uh, that, that I really, so I want you to take the part, uh, which is this, don't throw rocks at our house. I think that's really important. I, I, I do, you know, and, the, and not just metaphorically, but there is a lot of work, uh, Mike and Mac will attest and Phyllis and others, there's a lot of work that has gone into making our house a home. I just want you to know, there are some folks, and many of you are here, who have given of your time and your talents, and we are so appreciative for all the work that has gone into uh, renovating that house. Well, Brittany and I, not the first night, uh, I won't make that distinction, not the first night, because the first night, there were boxes everywhere and crying kids, and everybody's trying to get just used to a new place, and so the first night was chaos. But the second night, the second night, Brittany and I sat down at the couch in the chair, and I said, I love this house. And Brittany said it to me. We're so thankful for a church that was so willing to make a house into a home before we ever even arrived. There was love, not just paint, but love that were painted in our walls. People who just gave of themselves to make a home. We're so thankful. But you know what? There is a gem. In all of the things that were given, and all of the work that was done, there's one thing that stands out more than everything else. I don't even know. I, I didn't even talk to Brittany about this. I, but there was something that stood out to me above everything else. Somebody donated to us a kitchen table, dining room table. That was actually big enough for our whole family because for a while we've been growing our family, but our table has not grown. Uh, so we've been trying to fit everybody around this little four-person table for a while. And uh, high chairs take up a lot more room than you might think. Uh, and so when you have twins, things just kind of uh, exponentially get a lot bigger in your home. But the table will remain the same. And so we, we sold our kitchen table before we came, and we thought, well, we'll just, we'll just picnic style it for a little while. Somebody donated a, a dining room table for us. I can't tell you how important that is. Let's go back in your mind for just a minute to the good old days. To that time when you remember mama or grandma cooking in the kitchen. And all the family getting together at that dining room table. You remember those days? Yeah. Meatloaf, mashed potatoes and gravy, yeah, green beans, cornbread and biscuits. I mean, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, I'm, I'm not alone in this. You remember those days? Gathered around the table together. You know, I hope, I hope it was like, like this for you. You know, that was most every night in my family. We'd cook a meal, and we'd gather together. Or maybe we'd order a pizza. You know, that happened on occasion, you know. But we would gather around the table. It's a lost art today. 87% of parents believe that it's vitally important to have dinner together. But just over half actually do it a majority of the days before. Just a lost art. It's hard because we're busy and we've got hectic schedules and competing interests and things that are going on. And I get it. I'm not trying to make anybody feel guilty if you don't dine around the table. But can I just tell you something? There's something really almost magical about gathering around the dining room table with your family. And there's even been studies that have been done that, that seem to indicate that there are some benefits not just, not just to promote a sense of unity, brotherhood, not just uh, that it would lower the likelihood of high risk behaviors in adolescents. I don't know if you do that or not. Lower the risk of obesity. Unless you're Baptist, in which case, you know, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Because when we gather around, we like to deep fry everything. That's just the way it is. <laughs> Lowering the risk of Depression and suicidal thoughts, lowering the risk of eating disorders. Uh, allowing parents to have time where they can spend with their kids. When the TV's off and the iPads are 
not at the table in the phones you put in, where you can actually find out what's going on in their lives. It, eating around the table is a predictable routine and structure helpful in aiding members to monitor each other's lives and to interact. In a world of social media, which is anything but social, where you never actually have a face-to-face -face conversation, the dinner table provides that kind of ministry and opportunity for us. In, in fact, it improves vocabulary. I didn't know that. I read that in a study this week. Actually, it allows for the formation of about a thousand unique and rare vocabulary words for your kids over the course of their lives. Promotes uh, and deepens and enriches relationships. And uh, by the way, you know, after it's all prepared, which can be stressful sometimes, I understand that part. Eating a meal together, that's, that's very relaxing. There's all these benefits of eating together. And so it, it, it's amazing to me that today, after all of this is said and done, after the preacher finally stops preaching, right? I get it. Talk about people with mashed potatoes and then we got to keep going. we got to keep listening. I understand how hard that can be. Today, we're going to gather together in fellowship. All morning long, I've seen these carts of food going by. And I tried all morning long to get those guys to just let me keep that cart there. I would guard it, take care of that, offer quality control, and they just keep bringing it back to the kitchen, ignoring my requests. <laughs> Seems like this might be going on. I, I don't know. But we're going to gather together at the table. And we're going to eat together. We're going to fellowship. And we're going to talk. We have this beautiful opportunity. You know, it shouldn't be any surprise to us that God had something to say about the table. About eating together. I mean, God instituted feasts for his people. He wanted them to gather together as family to talk about his law. He wanted parents to pass along to their children, to the next generation, all of the words of his law. And he did that the majority of the time around the table. And so it should come as no surprise that so much of Jesus' ministry happened at the table. You know, if you actually go back and look, about a third of the Gospel of John, happens around meals. And somewhere along the lines, I think that we forgot this piece of things. You know, if you're a missionary overseas, a lot of times you don't invite somebody to church. You invite them to dinner. Why? Because what might be intimidating for someone to come to a Bible study or, or a small group or to a church worship service, that might be a cultural divide too great but what missionaries and what we have to understand is that we might not be able to invite our neighbors to church just yet. They might say no to that, but more often than not, they'll come to our home for a meal. They'd be willing to break bread with us, even if they wouldn't come and worship with us just yet. So Jesus, in his own ministry, would go and he would break bread. And he would dine with people. There's a passage of scripture that we use a lot. That I've heard Gideons use many times in their presentation. And that, that even a lot of gospel presentations will use. Coming out of the book of Revelation chapter 3 verse number 20. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. You've heard this before. And if you will come and answer then I will come and... Does anybody ever put that last part? I'll dinner with them. I'll dine with them. I'll sup with them. This is the way the King James Verse says it. Have we missed that all these years? That Jesus, the God of the universe, who breathed the stars into existence, He desires to commune with us. To share a meal with us. So many times we've lost the heart of that. Instead, we've adopted what Barry and I were talking about this week, the country club mentality. 
Sometimes we feel like over the course of our lives we paid our dues. We're going to come in, we're going to sit in our pew, park in our parking spot. And we're going to obey our own preferences. And we're going to dictate our own criticisms. And this is going to be our club. Us four, no more. And we restrict the table. The beautiful thing about sitting across the table from someone is it doesn't matter what their creed is, what their color, it doesn't matter where they come from, what their background is, what sins that they participated in, how far they are away from Jesus. When I sit across the table from them, I look them in the eye. How many times was Jesus condemned for being a friend of sinners that he wanted to have dinner with sinners? We come so far that we've forgotten that when we come to the Lord's table, Jesus took elements that they would find on any first century table. Bread. He said, whenever you come together to dine, whether it be chicken sandwiches from Chick-fil-A and sweet tea, whenever you come together and you dine together, when you sup together, remember my body that was broken. When you pour that drink out, remember my blood that was shed. It's not just an everyday meal. He took something ordinary and made it extravagant. Made it a table of grace for you and for me. And so sandwiched between a stinging rebuke that Paul gives to the church of Corinth about how they had taken something so special and ruined it. And the focus that they needed to have to examine themselves before they took of the Lord's Supper. He says the words that we always declare during this time. You know, this morning, I want you to examine yourself. Take a moment, bow your heads and close your eyes. But before we share communion together, before we sup together, before we fellowship, after we share this meal at the Lord's table, would you be willing to take a look at your own heart? Are you united with your brothers and sisters in Jesus here at Elbow Baptist Church? Would you agree how good and pleasing it is when brothers dwell together in unity? Are you excited about what the future holds? And are you ready? follow Jesus wherever he leads us as a church body. Would you, as I shared over a month ago, be willing to put your yes on the table? And today, before we share the Lord's table, would you be willing to place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ as your own Lord and Savior? Would you be willing, ready, today, to answer the call that Jesus extends to you today. Come and follow me. Lord God, we love you. That you became sin who knew no sin. That we might become the very righteousness of God. Lord, that there is none righteous, no, not even one. That all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But that you demonstrate your love for us. And that while we were still sinners, while we were still your enemies, Jesus died on the cross for me and for these. Lord God, your word says this, that if we would confess you as Lord. If we would believe in our heart that God, you raised your son Jesus from the dead, that we would be saved. In fact, 
It goes on to say that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It doesn't matter what anybody in this room has been going through, whatever their circumstances, whatever their heritage, whatever color of their skin, whatever sin may have plagued their life for years. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The foot of the cross is level ground. And God, we're so thankful for this table this morning. Lord God, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow. It makes me white as not because of anything that I did, but because of what you did, your Father. God, thank you for your son shed blood and broken body on that cross. Pay the penalty for my sin. And God, if there's anyone here today who's never made that decision to follow Jesus, may today be the day of salvation. Would they call out to you in simple obedience and say, God, forgive me. Yes, I will follow you. It doesn't have to be any spectacular, long, drawn-out prayer. Just very simply, Lord, hear my prayer. Forgive me. Save me. Rescue me. I will follow you. No turning back. If in this room you've prayed that prayer before, maybe today it was the first time that you prayed that prayer, but if you've ever prayed that prayer, we invite you as a follower of Jesus, as a believer, and our good and faithful Father to share in this table with us. And I'm going to invite Pastor Barry to come and I'm going to invite our deacons to come forward. And we're going to share in this time together. So deacons, will you come? Paul, first Corinthians. Chapter number 11, verse number 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. <coughs> and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant which was shed for each and one of our sins. When we drink this, drink the all in remembrance of me. When we commune together, when we fellowship together, even after this service is over, when we go and we enjoy chicken salad sandwiches and meatballs and all of the lovely goodies that have been provided, let us never forget the bread, the cup. Let us never forget that He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sins. Punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds, you and I, we are healed. Praise God.